Okay, we're going to get started today. So um, I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, who is uh, Dr. Joe Corbeau. And he's from Washington University in St. Louis. And um, I haven't known him very long. I met him about a little over a year ago when I was a guest speaker at WashU. And I, we found out we had a lot of common interests uh, related to um, carotenoids in the eye and working on animal models such as birds, et cetera. And he's going to be telling us some about that today. He um, is a Californian, a true Californian, has been uh, grew up in Los Angeles, went to uh, Stanford where I learned he was a linguist and a biology major, so he had, he had good diversity. He was very into Latin and was even, I think, a championship Latin person, whatever that means. And, um, uh, but he did, he did very well in the state championships in California. Uh, then went on to Stanford, where, or that's where he was at Stanford. He then did his MD, PhD at UC San Diego and uh, decided to uh, do his, go into anatomic pathology and was at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And that's, and soon after that, uh, he did some postdoctoral work with Connie Sepko, is that right? And the, which is where his connection to vision came. And so he, even though he is still a professor of pathology and he is a, a neuropathologist, not an ocular pathologist, a lot of his research work is focused on vision uh, especially related to a genetic regulation of vision, and that's what he's going to be talking about today. And also, he is a true biologist also, and will be telling us some about vision in animals and birds, I think, some too. So with that, I will bring Joe up. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, um, and thanks, Paul, for the nice introduction. I, um, I'm actually going to talk about birds, but at my noon seminar. Um, so. Uh, if you want to hear about that, uh, please come at that time. Um, so today I'd like to start with a, a little clinical anecdote um, about a <clears throat> Turkish gentleman that contacted me a number of years ago um, and told me about his wife that had retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, they were interested in having a baby and wanted to find out the genetic basis of her retinitis pigmentosa to know the prospects for the baby and whether the baby might be born with the disease. Um, and they were having difficulty finding out uh, the cause of her disease. And they had heard about some of our research. Uh, and he was interested in knowing whether we might be able to help them identify the cause uh, in this particular case. And so I said, well, perhaps we could help. Um, and so I uh, suggested that we start by, by looking further into the history. And he said, well, um, can I send you her, her pedigree, her family tree? I said yes, and then he immediately emailed me this. And so this gentleman had really uh, gone to town and was very aggressive in pursuing uh, this question and it generated this, uh, this remarkable family tree, which I'll point out a couple of things. And one is that his wife was the only affected member of a very extended pedigree. And the second thing is that uh, this, this pedigree sort of gave me a, a sudden cold sweat and a bad memory of medical school trying to uh, figure out inbreeding coefficients for a patient like this. So, but you can see that there's quite a bit of inbreeding in this family, and I helped him interpret this by saying that maybe uh, this suggests that her retinitis pigmentosa might be an autosomal recessive form of retinitis pigmentosa. And he said, oh yeah, I, I'm aware of that, and, and we've already tried to evaluate for it what the different causes of uh, retinitis pigment autosomal recessive retinitis pigmentosa that were known at this time. Uh, and she said, he, he doesn't have any mutations in any of these genes. Um, so I said, well, okay, that makes it difficult. We also uh, talked about whether she had mutations in autosomal dominant forms of the disease. She also didn't have any mutations in the genes that were known at that time. And so I said, well, that, you know, makes the problem a little more difficult because retinal disease and photoreceptor regeneration is a very genetically heterogeneous family of disorders. Uh, there are over 200 different retinal disease genes. Mutated can cause degeneration of photoreceptors. Uh, and notably, the majority of these genes are photoreceptor genes in that they're either specifically expressed in photoreceptors or enriched in this cell type. Um, and at the time, uh, a number of genes were known that were involved in also recessive retinitis pigmentosa, and that list has continued to grow. Um, but still to this day, a sizable fraction of them are in fact unknown. And so patients come in, you sequence all these different genes, and you fail to find a mutation. 
And so I said, then the next step, you know, would be to try to proceed further with this. And he stopped me again and said, um, how about if I send you her exome sequence? So he already obtained an exome sequence for this patient, which it was, again, at the time, surprising. Now it's becoming more and more common. And these patients are really taking uh, control of their own uh, genetics. So after he sent us that, we were actually able to very rapidly um, identify a candidate causal gene that turned out to be the gene upon further investigation uh, that was causing her disease. And so um, today, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about this uh, approach we use to read coding variants and identify uh, the coding variant that caused this patient's disease. Unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about one of the major uh, areas of work in my lab, and that is how to interpret non-coding variation in the genome. This has been a major uh, interest of my lab for many years, how to map and identify non-coding cis regulatory regions that control gene expression. Um, the majority of functional human genetic variation, probably 80 to 90 percent of it, lies outside of coding regions, and for the most part is thought to affect these non-coding regions, um, and either subtly or in a major way, uh, modify predisposition to disease. I won't have time to talk about that today. Instead, I'll focus the majority of the talk on uh, two different very early stage ideas for possible therapy, uh, one involving the direct reprogramming of rod photoreceptors into cones, uh, and the other uh, our efforts to uh, develop a infrared optogenetic approach to therapy. I'll tell you about those if you don't. So this audience obviously doesn't need this introduction. I'll go through it very quickly. Um, as we know, vision occurs when light passes into the eye through the thickness of the retina to reach the photosensitive outer segments, where the light signal is converted into an electrical signal that's then processed via the inner retina and then passed to the brain as visual information. Um, there are two main photoreceptor cell types whose cell bodies reside in the outer nuclear layer, rods and cones. And outside of the fovea, of course, the predominant photoreceptor type is the rod, constituting about 95% of all the photoreceptors, uh, extrafovial photoreceptors. Another thing I want to remind you about, because it becomes important shortly, and that is that photoreceptors are a ciliated cell type. That is, there is a connecting cilium that, that bridges the inner to the outer segment, acts as a critical conduit for the passage of proteins to the outer segment. So some of you may be less familiar with exactly how transcriptional regulation works. This is the bread and butter of what my lab does. Um, and I give a toy example here of a gene, say, that's expressed in a developing mouse embryo, in developing limb buds, in the uh, retina, and say, in the developing brain. And the way typically that a uh, complex uh, developmental pattern of expression will be established is via the action of so-called cis-regulatory elements. These are non-coding stretches of DNA that contain uh, multiple binding sites for both transcriptional activators and repressors, which bind to the DNA and then direct the expression uh, of a nearby gene in a specific pattern. So you might have a non-coding uh, cis-regulatory element driving expression specifically in the photoreceptors, another one driving expression in the developing brain, uh, in the limbs, et cetera. It obviously depends on the specific gene. Um, so these finding where these regions are in the genome, mapping them, and characterizing the detailed um, architecture of the sequences and how that mediates gene expression is one of the major efforts of my lab. Transcription factors, as I said, are the main players that bind these elements and control expression. They control spatial and temporal patterns of expression, as I'm depicting here, but crucially, and something that's overlooked sometimes, that they control quantitative levels of expression. And a lot of functional um, genetic variation in regulatory regions is likely to not affect spatiotemporal patterns, which can be a really gross effect, but the quantitative levels, the fine tuning of gene expression um, in different tissues. So I'm going to summarize a lot of data very briefly for the sake of time, but one of the early approaches we took to try to identify the non-coding regulatory regions that control gene expression in rods and cones is we studied a key regulator of photoreceptor gene expression called CRX. Uh, it's a transcription factor that's absolutely required for the development and uh, differentiation of both rods and cones. In human patients that have mutations in CRX, you get labor congenital amaurosis, 
uh, and you get a failure of formation in the outer segment of both rods and cones. So it's absolutely critical. It's sort of a master regulator of photoreceptor gene expression. We reasoned that that would help us pinpoint many of the critical non-coding regions that regulate photoreceptor gene expression. So we'll use a technique called CHIPSI to map the location of where CRX was bound across the genome in mouse photoreceptor cells. And this slide summarizes that data in one slide. So if you look and sum the distribution of CRX bound regions or CBRs across the entire genome, um, and you place all genes on top of each other, you can see that they occur both upstream and downstream of genes, sometimes even internal to the gene body. But most importantly, that there's a real peak of clustering of CRX binding right near the transcription start site of genes. Okay, and again, this is data that's summed over all the genes in the genome. This is in the mouse, um, but it gave us a clue that this might be a useful tool for prioritizing candidate genes in patients that have a disease caused by an un uh, have, have a retinal disease caused by mutation in an unknown gene, uh, because we already knew that of uh, the genes that are known to contribute to disease. Uh, many of them are photoreceptor specific or photoreceptor rich. We reasoned that genes that have a lot of CRX binding specifically around them would be good candidates to evaluate for novel retinal or photoreceptor disease genes. So that's the approach we took. These data are from the mouse. What we did was use a bioinformatic tool to map the mouse uh, non coding regulatory regions onto the human genome. And then we did something very simple. We basically went across the human genome. And we assigned these CRX bound regions, and here's a number of them clustering around the rhodopsin gene, um, to individual genes simply based on proximity. And the idea is if you have a cluster of CRX bound regions around a particular gene, then it's likely to be regulated by CRX and probably a photoreceptor gene. So we do that, and um, we can then tally essentially the weight of binding of CRX at these different regions. Uh, for each of these genes and come up with a simple numeric score for every gene in the genome, the extent to which that gene is regulated by CRX, okay? Um, and so in mapping studies where you have a pedigree uh, family with multiple affected members, you can often narrow down to a sometimes sizable stretch of the genome uh, where a particular disease gene may reside, but it can be a large region, still hard to figure out exactly which gene is involved. So first to sort of test uh, whether this approach would really work, we looked at genes that, um, which were already identified as photoreceptor disease genes. And we said, okay, what if we uh, had a pedigree where we mapped a disease gene to this uh, 50 gene interval that included rhodopsin, but we didn't know that rhodopsin was the disease gene. Would our approach help us prioritize that and quickly identify that? And obviously this is a straw man because rhodopsin is such an important gene in photoreceptors, it would be a logical choice to look at. But there are many photoreceptor genes that are really not so obvious. Um, and so when you do this approach and you tally all those CRX binding scores across this region, indeed rhodopsin comes out at sort of the top of the list. And again, that's maybe not surprising. But if we took this approach and then try that with all of the, what at the time were the known um, causes of retinitis pigmentosa. In about two thirds of cases, the actual causal gene um, was in the top three candidates when we ranked them with this approach. So we figured this, is, this doesn't work in all cases, but it does seem to work, uh, at least in a significant subset of cases. And so then we tried to apply the same approach to our patient. Now the situation is a little different. We didn't have genomic mapping data. Uh, we had an exome sequence for a single patient, um, and this is a simplified version of her pedigree, but we looked at it anyway, used this approach, uh, and basically found that there were about 40 genes that had homozygous variants predicted from the exome sequencing. We were predicting that she had autosomal recessive disease, so that's why we focus on those. Um, and when we ranked them, we got a list like this. Um, we then tried to confirm the mutations in the candidates starting at the top, and the first several turned out to not actually have homozygous mutations, and that's a pro common problem with exome sequencing is you need a lot of false positive results. Uh, but this fourth gene, MAC, turned out to have homozygous mutation. The patient ultimately proved to be um, the gene that was causing her disease. So what is MAC? This is a male germ cell associated kinase. This is sort of an odd name for a rather odd gene in that it has a, a very curious expression pattern. As far as I know, it's expressed in only two places in the human body. It's expressed in photoreceptors and it's expressed in the testis and developing sperm. 
and um, it is a uh, contains a map kinase domain at the end terminus, and we um, found a mutation here in this patient. We then subsequently worked with a consortium of European scientists to identify five additional families or small pedigrees that had additional mutations in this gene. And it turned out that all the mutations identified, <coughs> excuse me, identified at that time fell within this N-terminal um, map kinase domain. <coughs> we went on to uh, evaluate the effects of these individual changes on the uh, kinase activity, and indeed, several of these completely abrogate kinase activity. So it suggests that whatever this is kinase, uh, whatever this kinase is doing, the kinase domain is, is critical for the function of this gene. Um, and so it, it's interesting that around the time that this work was going on, a, we were sort of surprised by a paper that came out of Japan for Okawa's group where they were studying this gene in the mouse. Now, the mutation in MAC in the mouse had been made almost a decade before by a group that was studying its potential role in spermatogenesis, and they found only very minimal defects and no decrease in fertility, and that might explain that no one's ever observed any changes in fertility in, in male patients that have mutations in disease, interestingly. Um, they did see a very curious cell biological phenomenon, and that is this is an antibody stain of wild type and mac mutant mice, uh, mouse retinas uh, looking in the region of the inner and outer segments. Uh, and green is an acetylated tubulin antibody, uh, which is a marking portion of the, the cilium. And you can see in the wild type, the cilium looks like this, but in the mutant, there are abnormally long cilia, uh, which is a really curious phenotype. But most importantly, over time, it was found that there's a progressive photoreceptor loss, so a photoreceptor degeneration in the MAC mutant mice. So this corroborated the idea that these mutations were actually causal in humans and were likely to be leading to photoreceptor degeneration. Now, one of my favorite aspects of this gene and this story is that MAC is an extremely uh, deeply phylogenetically conserved gene. Um, in fact, there's a remote uh, ortholog that's present in the unicellular algae, Chlamydomonas, and these uh, algae have two flagella um, that in the mutant are abnormally long, so it's, it, even the phenotype is conserved. And since this is a plant and we're talking about um, animals here, um, this is a gene that's been around for maybe approaching a billion years of evolution. There are other genes, interestingly, in uh, the pathway uh, that regulate ciliary length in Chlamydomonas uh, that have been identified. Unfortunately, the evolutionary distance is so great we've never been able to find uh, clear orthologs of those other gene products um, in higher organisms or in, or in uh, humans. One last point is that mutations in MAC have turned out to be uh, the most common cause of heritable retinal disease in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. So um, an interesting and sort of surprising fact that goes along with this story. And finally, back to the patient and her husband. Um, so armed with this information, they, felt, uh, they sequenced uh, the MAC gene and the husband found that he didn't carry uh, mutations. Um, and they went on to have a, a child that's healthy and, and uh, unlikely to at least develop this form of the disease. So despite the fact that um, we can't yet offer good treatments to these patients, um, it's nice that the genetics can sometimes still help uh, inform their decision-making process. Okay, um, now I'm going to turn to the second part of the talk and tell you um, two stories about, as I said, early stage efforts uh, to develop new treatments for uh, photoreceptor degeneration. And so, I ask you to imagine another scenario where, let's say, this uh, newborn little girl uh, turned out to have, say, homozygous mutations in MAC or other gene that's uh, involved in, uh, that causes retinitis pigmentosa. Um, I think this is going to occur more and more as genome sequencing, exome sequencing, and whole genome sequencing becoming more and more common. There'll probably come a day fairly soon where newborns might routinely be sequenced, their whole genome might be sequenced. We need to be able to interpret that data and, if possible, act on it uh, in advance. Uh, and some of these diseases obviously have their onset uh, a little later in life, and so there may be a significant therapeutic window in which one could act to forestall or prevent 
the onset of disease. I mean, this is a major goal. And so if we entertain this scenario, the question is, how can we do this? Um, <clears throat> one approach that's been taken, obviously, is gene replacement therapy, where you have a gene that is defective, you try to deliver it by a virus, uh, we introduce a good, healthy copy, of, intact copy of the gene, and then restore the function. Uh, and that's one approach, but it's sort of one disease gene at a time that has its problems in terms of drug development and so on. And so a bit of a holy grail in the field has been to develop therapies that can be applicable to a broader range of diseases, or so subset of forms, of genetic forms of retinal degeneration. And so <clears throat> we set out with the hope of trying to um, develop an approach that could be used and could be applied to multiple forms of disease. So just briefly to summarize the mouse model here of uh, retinitis pigmentosa, and what you see is a progressive loss of photoreceptors in the outer nuclear layer, but if we look a little more closely, what you find in fact is that there's an early loss of rods depicted in red here, and only later a secondary loss of cone photoreceptors. So this is a typical progression of retinitis pigmentosa, right? Early loss of rods and a secondary uh, non-celotonous loss of cones. So we know that a lot of forms of retinitis pigmentosa are caused by mutations in rod-specific genes. Those genes expressed only in rods, not in cone photoreceptors yet. Nonetheless, you get this invariable secondary uh, death of cones. There are many possible reasons for that, but one is that you have a massive loss of photoreceptors in the outer nuclear air, creates a toxic environment, introgression of inflammatory uh, cells and mediators that probably make it for uh, non-congenial for the survival of cones. And so we had this idea, and, and I still think it's a, a tad uh, crazy, but um, we had the idea that you might be able to forestall or prevent this secondary loss of cones if you could uh, take the uh, rods that are going to express a, a mutated gene and to directly convert them into cone photoreceptors. The idea being that if, if it's the disease that's caused by mutation in a gene that's specifically expressed in rods, then if you were to convert the cell into a cone, a gene, a cell type that doesn't even express that gene, then in theory you might be able to prevent the effects of that mutant gene on that cell. And to pursue this idea, we leverage knowledge of the development of photoreceptors where it's well known that a photoreceptor precursor makes a developmental fate <coughs> choice uh, and depending on whether a particular transcription factor called NRL is expressed, um, it either becomes a rod or a cone. So if NRL is turned on in that precursor, it differentiates as a rod. If NRL is not turned on, it differentiates as a cone. And we know in the mouse, if you knock out NRL during early development, then <coughs> cells that would have normally been fated to differentiate as, as rods will differentiate instead as cone photoreceptors, okay? And so we developed a mouse that had a flox allele of NRL with the idea that we would wait till adult stage, acutely knock out NRL, and then see what happens. Do, as in development, do the rods then convert directly to cones? And so with this mouse, we would grow it up to around day 42, um, then we would use 4-hydroxytamoxifen to induce uh, knockout of the gene and then sacrifice the animals a certain period of time later. And the first thing to note when we do this um, is that in the adult NRL knockout that there's initially <coughs> rather good preservation of the outer nuclear layer. So the cells are still there intact. Um, and furthermore, we did a series of in situ hybridizations for both rod and cone specific genes to see what's going on at the level of the transcriptome. And so here I'm showing NRL itself, which is nicely disappears uh, in the adult NRL knockout, as you might expect. Um, but we were first initially very pleased to see that other rod specific genes, such as GMB1 and GNAT1, component, and genes that encode comp components of the rod phototransduction cascade, were also uh, completely eliminated. However, as we looked further at other rod specific genes, we found that m nearly all of them <coughs> were markedly reduced in their expression when you acutely knock out NRL. But many of them still had relatively modest residual levels of expression. Now mind you, that's in contrast to the developmental or embryonic knockout of NRL, where all these genes are pretty much completely gone. Okay, so that really suggests that the phenotype we're getting when we acutely knock out NRL in the adult uh, is, is somewhat different than what you get during development, which we were 
surprised by. If we look at genes in cones, we found the opposite. So in some cases, we saw a pretty marked derepression of cone gene expression in what would have been rods. Um, but in other cases, particularly in the cone opsins, we really saw very little change in expression. Now, it looks a little lower here in the adult knockout, uh, but if you quantify this by qPCR, um, there really isn't any change in either of the two cone opsins. Again, that's different. Uh, then the embryonic knockout, so in the embryonic NRL knockout, OPN1SW, which includes blue conopsin, is markedly derepressed and expressed at high levels throughout all of the cells that would have been rod photoreceptors. Okay. So in other words, to summarize the gene expression data, um, knockout NRL during development, you get a true transfading of what would have been a rod into a blue cone. But when in the acute adult knockout, you get a marked decrease in many rod genes and a increase in a subset of cone genes, but not all of them. And so in other words, it's a sort of partial reprogramming of a rod into a cone, uh, giving you a sort of intermediate uh, gene expression um, phenotype. We looked a little further at this phenotype and we used electron microscopy to analyze the structure of the nuclei in the cells in the outer nuclear layer. Uh, as you probably know, in the mouse and many other uh, nocturnal mammals, uh, the rod nucleus has a very special architecture where the majority of the heterochromatin is in the center of the nucleus and forms a very thick ball that is, is very electron dense uh, like this. Um, we found in the acute adult NRL knockout, um, there's several changes in the architecture of the nuclei. For one, they're not typically as spherical, they're larger on average and more irregular, which is more of a cone-like uh, feature. Many of the cells have a looser heterochromatin with more euchromatin around them uh, in the periphery, which again is more cone-like, but the fundamental chromatin picture is still rod-like for the most part. And the last thing is uh, many of these, uh, these intermediate or reprogrammed rods have juxtanuclear mitochondria, uh, which is relatively rare in normal rods, but fairly common in normal cones. And so we took this as, um, as evidence that there is sort of a hybrid phenotype here where the ultrastructure reveals uh, some cone-like features in the reprogrammed rods, but for the most part, they still look pretty rod-like in their heterochromatin pattern. So one other aspect we evaluated in these reprogrammed photoreceptors was their physiology. Um, and this requires just a bit of background. So as we all know, um, photoreceptors use a, an 11 cis retinal chromophore uh, in the opsin. That is the key photoreceptive molecule that undergoes an cis to trans isomerization upon a receipt of a photon of light. Um, then that spent chromophore, the all trans chromophore, um, has to be released from the opsin and the photoreceptor cell, has to be trafficked up to either the RPE or the Mueller glia, where then it is recycled and then passed back to the photoreceptor as a uh, rejuvenated pigment. Uh, so in the case of the uh, visual cycle that passages through the RPE, both rods and cones can access the RPE visual cycle, and the RPE hands back 11 cis retinal to both the rod and the cone, ready to use for the next round of photoreception. Uh, the Mueller glia, in contrast, is a more recently characterized pathway for renewal of the chromophore pigment. Um, seems to be only accessed normally by cones. So cones can pass their spent uh, chromophore to the Mueller glia, which then processes it as 11 cis retinol, so the alcohol form, which goes to the cone. The cone then has to convert retinol into retinal um, to then make it usable by the cell. So rods normally cannot access this cycle. We found that our uh, acute NRL knockout in the adult, the acutely reprogrammed cells, make it then possible for the rod to access this Mueller glial cycle. So it suggests, too, that there is at least some physiologic aspects that are cone-like in these uh, partially reprogrammed rod photoreceptors. Okay, so that was a little disappointing for us, actually, because we were really hoping for a more complete direct reprogramming of the rod into a cone. It was partial in, in, in several different respects. However, 
we still wanted to go ahead and test our original hypothesis, namely that this type of reprogramming might be able to confer a pr protective effect on the rod photoreceptor, thereby in turn preserving the cells and then uh, in turn uh, decreasing the probability of secondary cone loss in, in a model of retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, and so we decided to test that idea and we used the uh, rhodopsin mutant mouse as a model of, of retinitis pigmentosa. In this mouse, there's a progressive death of rods followed by a secondary death of cones. So in that sense, it mimics uh, the human disease. And what we did was uh, we crossed our homozygous uh, flox allele of NRL into the rhodopsin homozygous mutant background, which has this progressive degeneration. And then at the adult stage, we injected 4-hydroxy tamoxifen in the mice to acutely knock out NRL reprogram the rod photoreceptors, and then see if a protective effect uh, was conferred on the cells, and specifically on the cones. And so this is what we found. If um, you look at the outer nuclear layer of the rhodopsin mutant control versus the rhodopsin mutant that's undergone acute NRL knockout, there's significant preservation of the thickness of the outer nuclear layer, and particularly the inner uh, segments, and uh, that difference in thickness is quantified here. But perhaps even more importantly, we found that if you stain for either of the two different cone opsins, that you see still pretty nice expression of cone opsins, indicating preservation of cone photoreceptors in the acute NRL knockout, uh, whereas uh, almost all cone opsin expression uh, is lost in the controls by the date that we're analyzing them. Furthermore, we did some uh, ERGs to analyze the uh, physiologic response, and we found that uh, with increasing flash intensity, there's very little response, uh, a, a photopic response um, in the controlled degenerated retina uh, mice, but uh, that we still got pretty good a rescue here of, of the electrical response um, in the rescued retina, so suggesting that yes, indeed, if you acutely knock out NRL in the adult, even though you're not getting a complete uh, and perfect reprogramming of the rod photoreceptors into cones, you still uh, can confer a protective effect against at least this one form of degeneration, uh, cause of degeneration. So this works in mice and mice that have a flox allele, but obviously that's not really a, an effective approach or a viable approach for treating human patients. And so we want to see if we could uh, acutely knock down NRL via adeno-associated virus using RNA uh, I or RNA interference against NRL. Uh, and so we, we created an AAV virus that carried an NRL RNA I. Uh, we injected it uh, subretinally, allowed it to spread out and then infect the photoreceptor cells. And so I have here a picture of a retina that was infected uh, with a construct that expresses uh, GFP ubiquitously just to tell us where the virus has infected. Uh, and then it also expresses NRL RNAi. And so you can see fairly nice and complete uh, infection at least through about two-thirds uh, of the retina here. And so then importantly, we wanted to reconfirm uh, that by RNAi we get the same kinds of gene expression changes that we saw um, when we did this with the flox allele. And so what we did is we took portions, uh, took pictures here of the retina uh, in the infected region, uninfected region, and crucially in the transition zone between infected and uninfected. And then we did again a series of in situ hybridizations for both rod and cone specific genes. And you can see very nicely that NRL expression is largely eliminated and that changes right here at this transition zone. Rhodopsin, if anything, is even at lower levels when we use the RNAi than we, when we flock down the allele. That was a little surprising. Uh, and then some other rod genes are down. But overall, uh, we saw a very similar picture with rod genes. So some of them are eliminated, some are reduced, most are reduced, uh, but not all of them are gone. And uh, contrary-wise, the cone genes were, a uh, subset were derepressed, but again, the uh, cone opsins were pretty much unchanged. Okay, so what you have is a scenario where uh, you're really decreasing the levels of rhodopsin, but you're not derepressing the cone opsins. There's not a lot of opsin being expressed in these reprogrammed rods. And so one way to look at them is that they have entered uh, maybe a dormant state. I don't exactly know what that means, other than they're, they're unlikely to be very responsive to light by themselves. Um, 
And so the last thing we tried, and this is still relatively preliminary, was we tried to treat uh, rhodopsin mutant mice with this NRL RNAi delivered by AAV. Uh, and we find that we can, in the infected cells, see um, some cellular preservation uh, relative to controls. But further experiments need to be done. Um, I should mention um, that a recent study presented uh, at the last ARBO meeting uh, by um, Zhijian Wu's group from National Eye Institute has taken up uh, this idea and is now using CRISPR-Cas9 knockout of NRL to see if they can get a sim confer a similar protective effect. They've looked at this, this is unpublished work, uh, but they've looked at this in several different mouse models of retinitis pigmentosa, and they report very good uh, rescue in a variety of different generation models with CRISPR-Cas9. So CRISPR-Cas9 might ultimately be, I think, uh, a, a more effective approach than RNAi to, to getting knocked down of NRL in the adult, um, in eventually in humans, perhaps. Now, there are caveats to this approach, obviously. Uh, a major one being that uh, mutations in NRL itself can cause retinitis pigmentosa. Okay, so you might argue, oh, you're sort of trading one disease, one form of disease with another, and I think that's a very valid point and one that would have to be considered and addressed. Um, another thing that I should note, however, is that the architecture of the transcriptional network that regulates rod photoreceptor gene expression in humans is, is fairly different from that in the mouse. So the best example is that a transcription factor immediately downstream of NRL called NR2E3, uh, when mutated in humans, causes enhanced s cone syndrome. So what goes on there, it, it suggests that the rods are actually being converted into a blue cone or a blue cone-like cell in those patients. If you knock out NR2E3 in the mouse, however, that is not what happens. So there's clearly been some rewiring of the transcriptional network that regulates the final tier of raw gene expression um, between human and mouse. And so I think we have to proceed cautiously and perhaps um, if, if this general concept were ever to be implemented as a therapy in humans, um, targeting NR2E3 might be uh, another possibility rather than Okay, so I'm going to turn now to the last section, um, which is quite different from what I've described before, and that is our efforts to develop a new approach to uh, infrared optogenetic therapy. But again, this is very early stage still, and I'm going to tell you most of the uh, very much preclinical types uh, of experiments we've been doing. Um, so when you think about therapeutic strategies for retinal degeneration, uh, you can sort of group them broadly into two categories. Those that could be implemented before degeneration uh, has its onset, say like when you know that that newborn has those mutations that's going to eventually lead to uh, retinitis pigmentosa, or um, after degeneration has largely progressed and you have very few photoreceptors left. Um, in the first group you have obviously um, gene therapy rescue or perhaps uh, more broadly applicable approaches like direct reprogramming of rods into cones. Uh, after generation, um, one of the most actively pursued areas is try the attempt to generate photoreceptors in a dish from stem cells and then re-implant them into patients. Uh, I think that strategy is, is fraught with a lot of problems, um, not just the difficulty of creating uh, photoreceptors from iPS cells, uh, but the implantation problem, getting photoreceptors to engraft and be functional in a degenerated retina, I think, is, is no small task. Um, and so, in, that, in the context of those difficulties, people have turned to some other approaches, uh, one of which is optogenetics. And so the idea here is that, although the photoreceptors are largely gone, um, the inner retinal cells are still present, and at least to a reasonable extent, intact. And so, people have thought of the idea of using uh, optogenetic constructs to endow those normally non-photosensitive inner retinal cells like bipolar cells or ganglion cells with photosensitivity. So what is an optogenetic construct? So these are microbial opsins, but they differ very uh, markedly from vertebrate opsins in that not only do they have a chromophore and can sense light, but they have uh, in the same polypeptide an ion channel. So what you can do is with the expression of this sing single gene product, um, you can control the flux of ions across a membrane with light alone. 
And this has been a huge boon in neuroscience because it allows direct interrogation and control of neural circuits, and they have optogenic actuators um, that can both activate or, or turn off gene circuits uh, with light, so you get very rapid control. And so this has now been attempted in some mouse models of blindness, and they've been able to get some rescue of visual function um, by introducing optogenic actuators either into the ganglion cells or into bipolar cells. I think bipolar cells are probably the preferred approach because then you still allow the retina to retain some of its downstream processing of, of the visual information. So one of the difficulties of this approach is most of the optogenic actuators that have been tested so far are maximally sensitive to fairly short uh, wavelength blue light. And so the idea is, uh, and, and there are some clinical trials that are already um, about to begin uh, in Europe is to use gene therapy to introduce the optogenic channel into bipolar cells, but then have the patient wear um, some sort of um, amplification goggles that take in the visual scene and then project very bright blue light onto the retina. And that's a problem uh, because blue light is pretty energetic and it has to be very bright because there is, uh, because you're cutting out the middleman, you go straight from the ops into the channel, you lose the amplification cascade that you get normal in normal bird photoreceptors. And so therefore, um, you have to apply very bright light to activate these optogenic actuators. Um, and so that's, that's what widely recognized as a problem in the field. Uh, and so one of the uh, desiderata is to create optogenic actuators that are red shifted. Um, that is, ones that can be activated with much longer wavelengths of light. Uh, the idea being that this will minimize phototoxicity. It will also minimize induced pupillary reflexes because those are dependent on activation of melanopsins, which are maximally sensitive to blue light. So if you can get really red shift your optogenic actuator, um, then you can induce uh, uh, gating with uh, longer wavelength light that won't activate the melanopsin and therefore won't induce a pupillary reflex, which will obviously limit the amount of light that's being delivered to the retina. Um, you can also minimize photophobia with longer wavelengths of light. Uh, and even facilitate possible macular therapy, because as we know, of course, the normal macula has lots of pigments that like to absorb in the blue region of the spectrum. Um, so if you, again, if you can use much longer wavelengths of light, then you could potentially use such optogenic actuators in, in that region without um, having the, the activating light absorbed. And so we came at this from a very sort of different and unusual uh, uh, channel, and, and that is, we got interested in a, uh, for, for pretty much completely other reasons, uh, a very old, almost 100-year-old problem in vision science. Um, so this is a problem that was first appreciated in the 1800s, where it was noted, uh, and at that time I should point out that, that many uh, vision scientists thought that there was only a single photosensitive pigment, um, and that it was the same in most animals and had a peak around 500, peak absorbance around 500 nanometers. And that was shown to be the case in mammals and in reptiles and amphibians for the most part. But then a group came along in 1896 and found if you look at freshwater fish, um, the absorption is redshifted up to about 530, 540 nanometers. And at the time, this group was unexplained um, until about mm, 40 years later when in the 1930s, George Wald, who later went on to win a Nobel Prize for this work, discovered um, the basis of this mechanism. And, and what he found was that these freshwater animals uh, use a different chromophore uh, that is red shifted relative to 11 cis retinal. And our favorite example of this is uh, migratory salmon. So when salmon are in the open ocean, they use uh, the typical 11 cis retinal chromophore, but when they migrate to inland streams, they encounter a red shifted photo, photo environment. Okay? So murkier water, it absorbs shorter wavelengths of light and red shifts the overall spectrum of light that the animals encounter. And so we're well aware that salmon undergo a suite of physiologic adaptations to adapt to the new environment, to prepare for spawning and all, uh, but it's less widely appreciated that they also dynamically red shift the sensitivity of their entire visual system to adapt to this red shifted photo environment. And so just a little more background on how that works, just to remind you, the visual pigment, as I've mentioned several times, consists both of an apoopsin protein as well as a covalently bound chromophore, 11 cis retinal. 
And then when a photon of light is received, the 11 cis retinol isomerizes into all trans retinol. That leads to a change in the overall configuration of the protein eliciting uh, the phototransduction cascade. And we're all familiar that in the course of evolution, opsins can change um, and lead to different tunings and absorption properties. That's how we get blue, green, and red cone opsins in humans. They all have the same chromophore, but the exact amino acid side chains that surround that chromophore change the electrostatic and steric environment around the chromophore, tweaking its exact configuration and thereby changing its light absorption properties and shifting it either toward the blue or the red, depending upon the specific array of amino acids that are uh, in the binding cleft. But another way animals uh, can shift their absorption is via changing the chromophore. And this is how salmon do it, and it's how many freshwater fish do it. And what they do is they take the A1 or vitamin A1 form of retinal and they simply add an additional double bond in the ring here. And it's a very simple modification, but because it affects all the chromophore in the retina, it can lead to a red shift of the sensitivity of all of the different photoreceptors and opsins. And the reason for that is that the number of conjugated double bonds here, that is alternating single and double bonds, is what determines the light absorption properties of a chromophore, or for that matter, any molecule of this type. And so by adding that extra double bond, you significantly increase the length of that conjugated chain, okay? thereby red shifting its absorption. And so this was known then in the 1930s when Wald, in a series of very careful experiments, established it. But the identity of the enzyme that actually added this double bond remained unknown until recently. And that's what I'd like to tell you about today. Just one more comment. Uh, I said that this was originally found in freshwater fish. It turns out that probably 15,000 or more species of freshwater fish use this switch uh, to a greater or limited extent. Salmon, of course, have a dramatic migration where they use it, but other animals change their A1 to A2 content uh, throughout uh, the different seasons as the quality of light changes from summer to winter. Um, other species like lamprey, when they migrate, also go from A1 to A2. In contrast, many amphibians uh, start in, with A2 in the aquatic tadpole stage and then go to A1 when they become a terrestrial or semi-terrestrial adult. And so it wasn't easy to get our hands on the right stages of migratory salmon. So we turned to an interesting result that had been published about 10 years ago showing that if you simply treat zebrafish with thyroid hormone, you can sort of induce many of the physiologic changes that salmon undergo. So we use zebrafish as a little uh, miniature model of migrating salmon. Uh, and we treat them with thyroid hormone for three weeks and we found that we can completely convert their, their chromophore from vitamin A1 to A2 and get a red shift. So then what we did was we reasoned that that's thyroid hormone treatment is probably inducing expression of the enzyme that adds the double bond to A1 to create the A2 chromophore. And so we took RPE from wild type fish and fish treated with thyroid hormone and we compared their transcriptomes by RNA-seq. And so what you see here, each of these dots represents a different gene transcript. Those that are on the diagonal, of course, are genes that are equally expressed between the control and the thyroid hormone treated but we found that there was one outlier here that was markedly induced upon thyroid hormone treatment in the RPE. Now in parallel with these zebrafish experiments, we were also doing similar studies uh, in another organism, the American bullfrog. And I said that most amphibians, when they go from a tadpole stage where they're expressing A2, they switch to vitamin A1 in the adult. But the American bullfrog is a little special in that in the adult stage, it likes to sit in the water in the pond like this. And the idea is that he can scan below the surface into the murky, red-shifted aquatic environment for prey down below, uh, but simultaneously be scanning the aerial environment for uh, bits and pieces it might want to eat above. And as far as I know, American bullfrogs will eat just about anything. You can find pictures of this on the internet. So they're very much an omnivorous creature. And so it's very important uh, that they feed themselves and keep an eye on both of these environments. And again, George Wall, in his fourth decade of studying this system in the, in the late 19, in the early 1970s, and it's one of his last publications, showed beautifully um, that there's a difference in the A1, A2 content in the dorsal and ventral RPE of the bullfrog. We reconfirmed this chemically, and we found that in the ventral RPE, that is the portion that's feeding the photoreceptors, looking up into the aerial environment, you only have the traditional vitamin A1-based chromophore 11 cis retinol. Uh, but in the dorsal RP, where you're 
feeding the photoreceptors, looking down into the murky aquatic environment, you have sort of a mixture of both A1 and A2, suggesting, again, that the enzyme that converts A1 to A2 is expressed dorsally in the RPE, but not ventrally. And so we did the same experiment by Ronnie Seek in Bullfrog, and we found, indeed, that the dorsal RPE expresses a transcript that doesn't appear to be expressed as high, at high levels in the ventral RPE. And these both, in the zebrafish and the bullfrog, turned out to be uh, orthologs of the same gene. This gene is CYP27C1, which is a member of the cytochrome P450 family of oxidases, oxygenases. These, uh, this is a very large family of enzymes present in many uh, diverse organisms. I think there's 57 different homologs uh, or members of this family in the human genome. Um, and they're familiar to many people, including physicians, because these are the family of enzymes that are primarily responsible for metabolizing drugs in the liver. Um, and pharmaceutical industry obviously has great interest in this because polymorphisms in these genes change the rate at which people metabolize various drugs like warfarin and other drugs. Um, and also other xenobiotics that come in when we eat plant material and, and, and whatnot. So just a, an aside real quick, but I won't get into this. This CYP27C1 gene is actually present in the human genome. It is absent from the rodent genome and from a variety of other mammals. So even though no mammal uh, has ever been shown to use vitamin A2 in the eye naturally, um, this gene is present. So it doesn't seem that it's expressed in the eye. It may be expressed elsewhere in the body. I can go into that in the question and answer if you're interested. Uh, but obviously we were focusing here on fish and amphibians where it very much is used in the eye to great effect. Um, but we wanted to pursue that question further and verify this. And so the first thing we did is raise an antibody against CYP27C1. Uh, we then put that antibody on extracts of dorsal and ventral RPE from the bullfrog and found uh, very nicely that high levels are expressed in the dorsal, but absolutely none is expressed in the ventral RPE, correlating with the expression pattern of the vitamin A2 uh, chromophore. We then did the same thing in antibody staining in zebrafish and found that the RPE specifically induces expression of CYP27C1 uh, upon thyroid hormone treatment. It's not present uh, in the untreated controls. We then went to look at the actual activity of the enzyme. And so when you uh, transfect tissue culture cells with a construct expressing CYP27C1, feed the cells vitamin A1, uh, you get production of vitamin A2 uh, in contrast to a mock transfected control. So that shows that indeed the, uh, this gene, this enzyme, is sufficient to convert vitamin A1 into A2. Uh, but actually, is it necessary in vivo? And to address that question, uh, we use Talon technology to engineer a zebrafish knockout of CYP27C1. We created a number of alleles that led to um, short uh, deletions that resulted in early uh, frame shift mutations and premature stop codons. Um, so I believe these are null alleles. If you take one of these uh, transheterocytic zygot mutants, treat it with thyroid hormone. In the wild type case, as I said, we can induce expression of CYP27. You get none of the protein in, this, in the mutant that we created, indicating that these are a true knockout. So I mentioned this before, but just to recap, you treat wild type fish with uh, thyroid hormone, you get a direct convert, uh, and quantitative conversion of A1 into A2. If you treat the CYP27C1 mutant fish, uh, with thyroid hormone, uh, you only have A1, so there's no shift to A2, indicating that CYP27C1 is absolutely required for the production of vitamin A2 in vivo. And so next, we collaborated with Vladimir Kefalov's lab at WashU to do single-cell suction electron recording of the red single cones of the fish to see if, uh, if they fail to shift in the mutant. Uh, and so when you do this in wild type uh, or mutant uh, red single cones that have not been treated with thyroid hormone uh, and you flash different wavelengths of light and then look at the electrical response, um, you see that they're very similar and they both have a, a peak sensitivity around 561 nanometers. However, when you treat with thyroid hormone for three weeks in the wild type and the mutant, the wild type undergoes a dramatic red shift up to 618 nanometers. So it's almost a 60 nanometer red shift that's achieved when you switch from vitamin A1 to A2, but the mutant uh, fails to shift completely as we expect because there's no production of vitamin A2. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so the last assay we did was to test whether this actually affects their behavior because 
the ultimate uh, evolutionary pressure that probably led to this interesting uh, enzymology that allows these animals to redshift their visual system is that it actually permits them to see further and more deeply into these murky redshifted aquatic environments. Because um, otherwise, why would, it, why would it be selected in evolution? And so what we did was create a behavioral chamber where we could directly observe the response of the fish to light. So zebrafish are, adult zebrafish are positively phototactic to light, so they swim toward a light source that they can see. Uh, and so what we did was put a very, very long wavelength infrared 940 nanometer backlight underneath a tank, and then we had a night vision camera above, so we could directly observe the fish swimming around um, in the dark as well as in the light. Uh, and then we had another LED light source, a diffuse light source, on one end of the tank, which we would intermittently turn on or off to see if the fish would swim toward it and spend more time at that end of the tank. And so just to give you a direct idea of what the data looked like, this is what, how the fish behaves when the lights are off. And this is speeded up a bit. These fish aren't quite this frenetic. Um, but the fish goes around and around, kind of feeling its way along the sides of the tank using a lateral line system. But this is completely in the dark, and the fish can't see anything. In contrast, if you turn the lights on down at this end of the tank, if it's a wavelength the fish can see, you'll spend a lot more time down at that end of the tank. Yeah, make some forays away from it, but then we'll come back and stay down there. Okay, so this is a very simple assay, and then what we wanted to do was quantify essentially the amount of time that the fish spent within one inch of this end, uh, uh, lit end of the tank. And so we did this with two different wavelengths of monochromatic light, 590 nanometer light, which is about a yellow-orange light, that we predict the red uh, single cones from both the wild type and the mutant ought to be similarly sensitive to this wavelength of light. So both wild type and mutant fish ought to respond and swim toward this light. Um, and a much longer near infrared wavelength of light, 770 nanometer light, which we predict the wild type fish will be much more sensitive to, but the mutant fish will be very poorly sensitive to this wavelength. And so when you do this first with the yellow light in the dark, uh, all of the different conditions spend about 25% of their time down at that end of the tank. But when you flip on the light, they spend between 50 and 60% of their time down in the tank. And it doesn't matter whether they're wild type or mutant, whether they've been treated with thyroid hormone or not, they all respond to the light. In contrast, when you use that longer wavelength near infrared light, only the wild type fish that have been treated with thyroid hormone appear to be able to see the light, respond to it, and spend more time down at that end. So these assays, like any behavior assay, are a little variable. Um, so there is some noise in the data, but we're pretty confident that these fish can indeed see these wavelengths. And you can play with the intensity and the wavelength of the light and be pretty confident that indeed the thyroid hormone wild type fish are the only ones that can see uh, this light. So that was uh, uh, the first uh, and very comforting demonstration of the adaptive value of this vitamin A1, A2 switch that had been studied for 100 years. Um, and uh, I think fairly uh, convincing evidence that CYP27C1 is the enzyme that mediates this switch. So that's uh, just a summary of what I just said. Um, and back to the therapeutic point. So our idea here is that co-expression of CYP27C1 might be a great way to be able to create localized pools of vitamin A2 in target cell populations that are being targeted um, for optogenetic therapy. So it's a paper came out a couple years ago showing that you can substitute vitamin A2 for A1 interchangeably in these optogenetic actuators, and indeed, just like vertebrate photoreceptors, they will, uh, vertebrate opsins, they will redshift their sensitivity. And so our idea is then to develop therapies where we co-express CYP27C1 with an optogenetic actuator, uh, usually actuators that have also been engineered to be redshifted, and with the ultimate hope that we can implement optogenetics using near infrared light. So very, very far red shifted from the current therapies that are under development uh, and that are actually being um, trialed in humans. And then there's all these attendant benefits that I already mentioned. So to just briefly summarize what I've talked about, um, my lab is developing <coughs> diagnostic approaches for reading both coding and non-coding variants and how they contribute to human retinal disease. And we're developing a number of early stage uh, therapeutic approaches, both direct reprogramming of photoreceptors uh, to prevent retinal generation in multiple forms, uh, genetic forms of the disease, 
and uh, infrared optogenetic therapies. To credit some of the people that participated in this work in the human genetics, uh, a big role was played by Annika van Holdener and Franz Kramer's group in the Netherlands, who are part of a very large European consortium that allowed us uh, access to uh, their uh, precious patient uh, data and allowed us to identify additional patients with MAC mutations. Um, in my lab, Cindy Montana, is a talented MD PhD student, now an ophthalmology resident at Washington University, um, who did the ro uh, rod reprogramming work. Uh, Jennifer Enright, also an MD PhD student that just graduated from my lab, is also going to be going into ophthalmology. Um, and she did the vitamin A1, A2 work. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. We have just a minute or two for questions. Yeah. Anything? Long talk, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Annie. So, I thought that was a great talk. I was wondering if the um, if you looked in newer cells regarding the CYP27C1. Yeah, you know, so, so in fish and, and, fib and, and in bullfrogs, it's only expressed in the RPA, it seems. Mm -hmm. But there are indications from other species, uh, I should say in zebrafish, in other species of fish, there are some suggestions that it might, the enzyme might also be expressed in milliglia. And, and the data that exists for that is that in the single retina, sometimes the rods and cones actually have a different ratio of A1 and A2. And one way to get that, of course, because only cones can normally access the retinal visual cycle, is that if you express this enzyme in, in milliglia. But we haven't confirmed that in those species yet. Any other questions? Any other questions? I do want to emphasize this work is very translational. And Joe, uh, you didn't show the cartoon that was done about CYP 27 c one Do you know? Oh yeah, that? yeah. There's uh, Sherman's Lagoon. Is yes. I, I'm not a cartoon reader, but apparently this is a syndicated cartoon, and, and they picked up on this and, and did a series of cartoons about yeah. CYP 27 c one The whole two week series <laughs> on his enzyme. Yeah, look it up. It's it's very impressive. So thanks um, for your attention. Yeah, please.